the thrones uh, and I have spoken here before and I guess I'm here again at the invitation of Ernie and Diego. A special shout out to Kelly. I really appreciate her hosting this. She's a very special friend. Diego has done a remarkable job uniting all of healthcare in the state of Nevada, particularly in Southern Nevada. And I'm very appreciative of his efforts. It's not always easy. And of course, Ernie, I don't remember a time in my life that I didn't know Ernie and he has done a remarkable job with the Game of Thrones when I first heard you know I first got an invitation to come to Game of Thrones yeah I thought I needed to dress up or something yeah but no and um, it's been a pleasure to come and support Game of Thrones and thank you for doing everything you've done for medicine and the advancement of medicine in the state of Nevada particularly southern Nevada last time I spoke to everybody I I was um, the CEO and senior provost of Toro University. I retired June 30th, and now I am devoting full time to running. I'm sure you've all heard running for mayor of Las Vegas. Contrary to popular opinion, I did not leave Toro in order to run for mayor. I, um, I, uh, my contract was running out. They wanted me to renew with another three-year contract. And I felt that I had done everything that I could do uh, to change Toro from a little unknown um, institution of higher learning that, um, uh, you know, that concentrated on health care to the premier medical school in the state of Nevada and we've at the, the school is remarkable in every way the programs are remarkable we are educating or we, I was helping to educate the next generation of health care providers for the state of Nevada and I, I thought it was time to leave so we did a one-year transition and somewhere along the year I started thinking what are you going to do with the rest of your life what what, uh, what makes, what excites you? What gets you up in the morning? And as much as I love Toro, and I was there for almost 10 years, I realized that public service is what, um, what I enjoy the most. I like uh, helping people and taking care of people. And I thought the best possible opportunity for me was to throw my hat in the ring for mayor. What I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about myself so you know why I'm doing this. Because the question I get the most is, why aren't you just enjoying yourself? Go to retire, travel, go, do. And I will uh, share with you why. Then we'll talk some issues. I'd like to concentrate on health care and education, if that's okay, and the importance of all of us being very engaged. And I will say this just as a taste, the I do not think health care fared very well in the legislature this year, this past session. And I think it's very important for those of us in health care. And you know, my family makes its livelihood in health care. My husband's a nephrologist, still practicing full time. My a daughter is a primary care physician in town. She's actually my primary care physician. I still can't get an appointment. So. Um, <laughs> Which is very, I paid her way through med school and now I can't get an appointment. Um, I um, am the granddaughter of immigrants to this country. Um, they came to America in order to escape the Holocaust. My mother's side of the family is from Salonika, Greece. Um, prior to World War II, half of the population of Salonika was Jewish by about 80,000 people. By the time the Nazis finished, there were only 1,000 out of 80,000 Jews left in Salonika. I have never been presumptuous enough to think that my family would have been among the 1,000 chosen to live. On my father's side of the family, in the same area where the fighting is taking place now between Russia and the Ukraine, that's where my father's side of the family uh, comes from. And a civilization that had existed in that part of the world for over a thousand years was completely exterminated during the Holocaust. So my family was already in the United States, both sides. So I grew up hearing stories about what life was like, where they came from, and what 
uh, what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations were uh, coming to America. And when they got here, they couldn't speak English. They had no money. They had no skills. The only thing they had was a dream. And that dream was that their children and their children's children would have a better life here in America. Uh, this country not only gave my family a chance to survive, which we did, um, but it gave us a chance to thrive, and we certainly have done that as well. Uh, so for me, public service was always a way of giving something back to this country for, not, uh, for taking my family in, because if it wasn't for the United States and if my family didn't have a chance to immigrate uh, to the United States, um, they would have never survived the Holocaust and I would have never been born and I wouldn't be sitting here speaking with you now. If I was a great singer, I'd be a singer. If I was a great artist, I'd be an artist. I'm not any of that stuff, but what I am is a very competent public servant um, that has devoted her life to helping her fellow man. Um, I chose... Uh, it, I think it's important to know that the reason that I do this is in order to pay back because I'm a great believer in actually paying forward. And the only way you can do that in my circumstance is to do public service. Now, I've been obviously totally immersed in the mayor's race over the last um, several months. And I can tell you what the issues are, although if you live in the city, if you live in the county, you are as aware of these issues as I am. They're very intertwined. When I talk to anybody, they will tell me the number one issue is homelessness. They want to do something to help people get off the streets. That's number one. Number two, affordable housing. And you can see how they are intertwined. There's a lot of people that are living on the streets that heretofore could afford an apartment. Um, I know when we first moved to Las Vegas, um, uh, my father was a waiter. And uh, the first home that we ever bought was a $33,000 home, the old party cinder block homes near Valley High School, because that's where I went to high school. So I know the importance of home ownership, of feeling that you're part of the community, you own something. Uh, it turned our life around. It turned my family. We weren't a vagabonds anymore, or transients. We were part of Las Vegas. And it was a small cinder block home off of Eastern Avenue that made that possible for all of us. Um, crime is a big issue, and I've had the opportunity to sit down with Kevin, um, our sheriff. We're very, very good friends because we worked together when I was at Toro to create a program after October 1 where Toro University trains every Metro officer for disaster training, medical training, because God, and you probably all know this, but in an active shooter situation, you cannot have medical personnel coming on site. So we're training and providing all of our Metro officers with uh, life-saving kits that they wear on their bodies, no matter where they are, in order to save a life. If they can come, if they come upon someone that it needs immediate medical attention. We have now trained three of the 4,000, 3,000 of the 4,000 officers have been trained, and that's due to a partnership with Kevin and I way about five years ago. So I think that um, that has been very, very helpful and continues to save lives to this day. Um, the fourth issue is economic growth and development. I believe the next decade is gonna be among the most explosive in the Las Vegas Valley, in Las Vegas. We're gonna get the A's. In a few years, we're gonna get an MBA team. And what that's gonna do is create more excitement, bring more people into town. People still come to Las Vegas for the same reason that my family moved here um, 60 years ago, because there's a job. And I'll let you, I'll tell you all how my family got here in a moment, but that's going to be very important. We're going to have more population, which means more building, more jobs are going to be available, and it is going to be an extraordinarily exciting time in the Las Vegas Valley, and we're all going to be a part of it. But something that I think is very important is that 
the success of this community, which will continue to grow and be successful, isn't success if it only affects people at the top or a very few number of people. Everybody has to have an opportunity to become a part of the success story of Las Vegas. And again, it's not, uh, it, I'll share with you my family situation. In 1963, my father was a waiter in upstate New York. He was having trouble making a living. One night, he put my sister and I and the dog in the back seat of our car. Uh, my sister and I, um, uh, my sister and I in the back seat. My mother, front seat, obviously. Everything we owned was in a U-Haul hooked up to the back bumper drove across country in the middle of the summer of the old Route 66. My dad had a letter of recommendation to get a job as a waiter in Southern California. Drove across country, no air conditioning in those days. You had a, a water bag on the front grill just in case your car heated up. And so we get, uh, we get to Hoover Dam on our way to LA. And there are signs, Las Vegas, 30 miles. Now, I thought my parents were so old. They were 31 and 34 at the time. They wanted to see Las Vegas. We never knew if we were coming back east again. Um, my mother didn't have a job. She was a stay-at-home mom. My sister and I were, um, you know, it was summertime. We didn't have to be in school. My dad didn't have a job. And as far as we knew, the dog had no plans. So we decided to stop in Las Vegas for the night. We never left. And one of these days, we're going to unpack the U-Haul. <laughs> Did that a long time ago. Um, I, I often say that it's not so much that I grew up in Las Vegas. I grew up with Las Vegas. Uh, when we got here, there were 80,000 people in the entire Las Vegas Valley. Now, of course, we're uh, hitting 2.5 million, and I see only growth to continue. There's going to be challenges. Water will be a challenge. I know Ernie wants to ask a question about water. Uh, there are other challenges, but I would rather be... Um, a part of a community that is growing than having the problem of living in a community that's constricting, losing your tax base, and really struggling to keep afloat. So I think we're in really, really good shape in the future. What the issues that I discussed, homelessness, affordable housing, uh, crime, these are issues that need to be dealt with, but I think we need to see a bigger picture. This is a world-class community. I mean, everybody, no matter where you go, anywhere on the planet, you say you're from Las Vegas, eyes light up, they want to know all about Las Vegas. I was in Israel in the backseat of a cab a uh, hundred years ago, and I uh, cab drivers talking to me in kind of some uh, uh, some alliteration of Hebrew and, and uh, English, and he said, I told him I was from Las Vegas for Tarkanian. I mean, he was, <laughs> he's, so everybody knows something about this amazing community. We're a world class, well known community. It's time that we really ascend to that. What does that mean? Better transportation. I sat on the Transportation Committee in Congress. I know what the needs are, and we really need to improve our transportation system. Another issue, obviously, is education. Where even though the governor put a lot of money into education this year, and you, we know that there's problems between the school district and the teachers. Um, they want a raise. I think they're entitled to a raise, and I hope they resolve this very quickly. Um, I was at Berkeley Elementary School a couple of weeks ago, and I spoke to the teachers. I told them I was very supportive of a uh, salary increase because I know what they go through. I know the challenges they have, and let's face it, our, we depend on our teachers to educate our children uh, six hours a day they're with these teachers they need to be compensated for the extraordinary work that they do but a good education is not only important for individuals in the school district but it's also important for democracy because democracy depends on a well-educated electorate making informed decisions so education even though it's not you know in the bandwidth of the mayor you still have a bull 
bully pulpit. And if we want economic growth and development, I was, a gay, I was vice president of the Sands Hotel. I know gaming very, very well. I love the gaming industry, but I also fully appreciate that we need to diversify our economy. The best way to do that is to improve our education system so that companies, high tech companies, others that have good paying jobs are going to want to relocate here to Nevada, particularly Southern Nevada. That's an important issue. Healthcare, and everybody in this room deals with healthcare on a daily basis. Um, we have to improve our health care system. Now, I come, as I mentioned, from a family of health care providers. I know how hard they work. And I was joking with Patty earlier. Um, I, um, my daughter is my primary. And I, uh, I have a friend that came from upstate New York. So I knew her since we were in kindergarten. We kept in touch all of these years. She moved to Vegas. And of course, she wanted to know what temple she should join and what, uh, what doctor doctor she should go to. And my first thing I, oh, got, call Dr. Stephanie. I just, you know, tell her that you're my friend and you'll get an appointment right away. Bonnie calls me back and says she can't get an appointment for two months. So I called Dr. Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, I paid her way through med school. I said, Stephanie, I said, this is a friend of mine since we were five years old. She goes, I, I have, I can't. She goes, she could see my uh, nurse practitioner. She could see my PA. I said, well, put her on on a waiting list. She goes, I have a waiting list. So that is the challenge we have in this community. Now we do not, and let me get on my soapbox here, um, because this is very important. And I think with the knowledge that I, I have acquired over the years, particularly running uh, Toro University that has a PA program, a PT program, an OT program, nurse practitioner program, as well as our uh, DO, as well as the DO program, um, we are educating the next generation of healthcare providers for the state of Nevada. Not enough. Now we do not have a medical student problem shortage here. UNR graduates 60 a year. UNLV is at uh, 60. They want to go to 120. Turo is graduating 180 students a year now, and everybody is matching, by the way. So it's not a shortage of medical students. It's a shortage of residencies to keep these student graduates, these future doctors here. Right now, we are educating a whole lot of future doctors to go practice someplace else because statistically, speaking, 70% of doctors end up practicing where they do their residency. Now, we need more. Now, we all know residency programs are generally funded by Medicare. Well, if we're going to wait for Medicare to fund programs in, in growth states like Nevada, like California, forget about it. It's not going to happen. So we were able to persuade Brian Sandoval, when he was governor, to put $10 million into uh, creating GME in this state. And um, we need to not only continue that, we need to increase it because the need is so great. We are growing our own. And when it comes to schools like UNLV and UNR, they are tax payer funded schools. So we are all paying for them to go out of state. It makes absolutely no sense to me. And so I would urge all of us to lobby our legislators and encourage them and our gov uh, to encourage them to increase the funding for graduate medical education. We can help solve our own problem, but we have to do it. And it can't keep going, well, maybe not this session, but next session, next session. We're done with next session. It's got to be the next session, because if not, we're going to fall further and further behind the eight ball. Um, New programs ought to be encouraged. Um, Toro has a PA program that is now up to 80. Every, I, 
I can say without fear of contradiction that when I was at Toro, I would receive a weekly phone call from some doctor. Get, get, well, how, can you get me some PAs? Can, when they graduate, can I, can I get them? Can I, blah, 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 blah. Uh, sure, um, but 80 is not enough to go around. And consequently, we need more of those programs. Um, I think with uh, increased population, which is going to occur, if we're in trouble now, we're going to be in worse trouble later. And again, if we want to attract um, good paying businesses, good paying jobs to Nevada, we have to improve our education system and we have to improve our health care system. Now, um, why, and Diego wanted me to mention this, I think it's very important and if I can encourage people in this room, and uh, look, my husband is a, a, a nephrologist, very, very smart guy. He could no sooner be a political scientist <laughs> as, as the man in the moon. He doesn't think that way, it's, he's very logical. But I would encourage people in the healthcare industry to not only get engaged and uh, encourage people with some background and some knowledge in healthcare to actually run for office. But if you are at all interested, and I know you're all much too smart for that, but, uh, but I, it would be very important. Um, the more people we have that understand the system, understand the needs of the healthcare community, which is the needs of our, our, our community, I think the better off we will be. So I'm very excited about that with my background in education, with my background in healthcare, background in gaming, and my background in economic growth and development. I think I could lead this city um, into a, a very, very bright future. It's bright now. It'll be brighter later. I think we need a steady hand, somebody that's been around for a while. And I was joking the other day, I've been around so long that people that didn't like me can't remember why they didn't like me. So, <laughs> so they like me now. And I'll give you a perfect example. I'm sitting there, of course, where uh, money is, as you know, the mother's milk of politics. So I'm, I'm making phone calls and I come upon this name. And uh, the woman that was sitting with me says, you should call them. I go, oh, no. I said, you don't know this history. I said, we do not have good history. They never supported me. That when I was in the assembly, they didn't support me. When I was on the Board of Regents, they didn't. When I was in Congress, no, no, no. Because give it a try. Uh, all right, and I think I, put, I started dialing just to prove that she was wrong. So I, I dialed the number. I say, hello, I'm making this name up. Tom, this is Shelly Berkeley. Shelly Berkeley, it's great to hear from you. I, it is? <laughs> so this, this has been a real experience. Um, look, I was in office for 30 years. And then 10 years, I was the CEO and senior provost of Toro. And now I've decided to come back into this. It's different. It is different now. I'm different now. When I started running at the age of 30, I was pregnant with my son, Max. I had such a hunger to do this that I, I think I was a bit overly aggressive and overly anxious. Now with time and the passing of years and, and I believe the wisdom and knowledge that I've acquired, it's made me a different person, a more thoughtful person, a more engaged person. I realized that you could work and you should work with anyone and everyone if you're going to get the right result. And one of the th values that I think I bring to the table is um, uh, I I know everybody in town. There isn't anyone that I can't pick up the phone and get um, I, I, to answer the phone. And I think that's going to be very, very important. I know the city council people well. I know the county commission people well. North Las Vegas, Henderson. And I think collectively, we could really make an extraordinary difference. And we shouldn't be fighting with each other. We, you know, it's uh, nobody knows when you cross from the city to the county line that you have crossed into a new jurisdiction. The importance is that we all work together. And I think one of the values that I bring to this is that nobody remembers why they didn't like me. So it's great. I think I could work with everybody in order to effectuate um, meaningful change and, and, and make us an even greater city than we already are. And with that, I think I'll I'll stop. Diego, is there anything that you would want me to address before we open it up to Q&A?
Is it all right? Okay, all right. Why, um, uh, let me say this. You may ask me anything. What I don't know, I make up anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, she sits on the board of the USO, and um, there's a large uh, number, which I'm well aware of, a large number of uh, our homeless population are veterans, and nationally it's 30%, and it is a very, very serious problem, but go ahead and I'll, I'll repeat what you say. Okay, turn your hearing aid up. <laughs> I, and then you bring it back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I also work with Project 150, which deals with homeless youth, displaced youth, as well as the Just One Project and the Aaron. And so homelessness is just rampant right now. Yes. I want to know what is going to be Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I think I'll have you on my homeless committee on day one because I could really use the help. Um, I've been. Uh, let me address this in a few ways. Uh, let me first hit the veterans. Um, it is unconscionable to me that. Um, there, is, there, there are 30%, 30% of our homeless population nationwide are veterans. And that indicates to me that we do not do a very good job transitioning our, um, our men and women um, that are in the armed uh, forces when they uh, return to civilian life. And the problem we have, and I sat on the Veterans Affairs Committee and was very active with US Vets and some of the other homeless shelters for veterans when I was in office. Um, we, um, I know, because I've observed it, that when these men and women are just about to leave uh, the, uh, their service, um, they're inundated with information. And you know, if, this, if you have this problem, you call this. If you have that problem, they want out. They're not listening. They've just put in their time, and now they're ready to go home. It isn't until they've been home six months to a year that they end up having problems. And then they can't remember who they were supposed to call, what they were supposed to do. And if we did a better job of keeping in touch with our vets after 90 days, after 60, uh, uh, 120 days, after a year, I think we would do better um, and they would do better on the outside because the transition back is sometimes extraordinarily difficult. Um, as you probably know, the Nevada State Legislature appropriated um, with the governor's um, not only approval, but um, with his urging, $100 million to go to um, home, uh, taking care of the homeless or figuring out what we're going to do with the homeless. That is supposed to be matched with $100 million from the resort corridor. And I have spent a considerable amount of time with the CEO of the Wynn Hotel, uh, who is um, heading this effort. And I think it's gonna be very important to ensure that whoever is put in charge of this very large sum of money knows what they're doing. And it's not a political appointment, it's somebody that has been dealing with the homeless um, uh, uh, as a career because this is an issue for two reasons. One, and, and again, let me say this, a girlfriend of mine um, for a long-term girlfriend runs the rescue mission. I sat down with Heather, you may know her, Heather Klein, sat down with her at breakfast 
and I said, uh, Heather, if I could wave a magic wand, what, what could I do to help you? You deal with this on a daily basis. She said, Shelly, the city of Las Vegas needs a mental health facility because so many of the people that are living on the streets have serious mental health challenges. They have serious drug addiction challenges and you cannot give them housing. And uh, you just getting them off the street and sticking them in a, an apartment or a, some sort of living arrangement or trying to give them job training when they have these mental health issues and they have these opioid addictions and alcohol addictions is just a waste of time. You need to deal with the root problem before you can actually do something to make them productive members of the community. And many of them are. They just don't make enough. So they're living on the streets and they're going to work that day. And that is a big, big problem. More than that, it's not only the humanitarian issues here and they are severe. It's also, we are in a tourist town. You cannot have our tourists who is, uh, the lifeblood of our community is the gaming and resort industry. You can't have people walking over homeless people in order to get into their hotels, in order to get into their businesses. So this is a critical problem. Now what I want, if we could refurbish um, I would imagine uh, that I would encourage that if there's existing buildings or existing uh, facilities that we can rehab in order to utilize them for the homeless, then that's the way we should go. If we're in an area that has no uh, facilities of that nature, then you build it. But it has to be a holistic approach. It can, I, I get people all the time that are just really angry and frustrated. They're good people, but just get them off the street. Get them off the, well, that's geography. That is not helping the problem. You're just moving somebody that has a real serious challenge from one street to the next, just so you don't have to look at it. Um, but they're, they're, uh, they still exist. So this is not an easy, um, there's no easy fix to this, and it has to be a sustained effort. And that will never get everybody off the street, but uh, we, can, we can go a long way, especially with $200 million to, to introduce programs and work collectively. And this means the feds, the state, the county, and the surrounding cities, because the problem affects all of us. And just the other day, I was driving down Desert Inn Road by the boulevard. There's tents out there now. And so uh, the people downtown don't want um, these tents in front of their businesses. Well, now they're in front of some other, other person's businesses. So we've got a long way to go with this. Also, a friend of mine, uh, um, his son is in the affordable housing business. And I was talking to him um, the other day, actually, uh, because I heard him give a presentation uh, because he can build affordable housing and he has federal money to do it. He's at getting approval from the public entities, city, county, to build a, an affordable housing um, uh, complex in a different neighborhood. The neighborhood people, everybody comes up, not in my backyard. So we're going to have to collectively, as a community, figure out what we're going to do. Because these affordable housing uh, complexes that are, are lovely, you would never know that they were um, affordable housing that's being subsidized by the feds. But if you're not going to, uh, if you're going to fight any place that they want to build it, we're going to continue to have an affordable housing challenge. So very complex. And thank you for asking the question. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just hit on two of my favorite top subjects. I'm Heather's uh, architect for the rescue mission. <laughs> <laughs> She's an amazing woman. She yes, she is. Um, we, just got plan we just got planning approval for the new women's center. Ah, oh, that's great. The um, capacity for the homeless. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I know who you mean. Um, Heather shared that with me. She's very frustrated. And then you touched on the, so if you could help there, that'd be great, but I think he's running against you. 
It's America. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, the healthcare issue is, is huge. Huge. Um, we had a, a healthcare, we had a, a behavioral hospital all planned on a piece of property that we own. 96 beds. I know. The operator fell away. We got the plans done and approved by the state health department. Any, any takers? I mean, this is a huge issue. And Heather's exactly right. I know it. I know it. Let me say this about um, a couple. <laughs> last month, my husband and I had tickets to go. We go every year to the Shakespeare Festival. We're big Shakespeare Festival supporters, and so and we stay at the same bed and breakfast every year. And we make appointments to have dinner and lunch with people from Las Vegas that are up there. So I stand up, and we got. I think we had tickets to five of the six plays this year. So I get up quickly from my couch. And all of a sudden, I heard a hideous pop. And I, my back just, oh my god, I thought I was going to die. And I, this never happened to me before. So I'm sitting there thinking, in a few hours, we're supposed to get in the car and drive to Cedar City. Should I go to the doctor or go to Shakespeare Festival? Dr. Shakespeare, I went to the Shakespeare Festival. Uh, great at the time, big mistake. My back is just killing me. And my, my, um, a uh, doctor daughter won't give me anything till I get an MRI and I don't have time to get an MRI. So does anybody mind if I sit down and continue this conversation? Okay, just give me a chair. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Oh, that is much better. Ah, okay. <laughs> I know, I just, uh, you know, I kind of think I'm superwoman. I could do anything. <sighs> Did you have more? No, no, no. Oh, that, that was it. Yes. Just a quick comment. Uh, the, the IQ technology we are commercializing, incidentally, good though, the VA. Uh, the VA has thousands of patents on the shelf. Identify this to be the one that's much needed for pets. So we try to commercialize that, but in the process, pace at which things move in the VA is rather disappointing. I wish it would get to the point faster. You know, um, I don't know if everybody knows, but um, when uh, okay, um, when I was in Congress, um, I uh, a group of I had all these different um, advisory groups. I had an African American advisory group, Hispanic women, and a veterans advisory group. And I had my first meeting, and a group of the lady um, vets, and they were mostly uh, wax and waves from uh, the Second World War and Korea. They came over to me, and they, in, th in those days, all we had was the Adelaide Del Guy Medical Clinic on uh, MLK. And they said, you know, we need a mammogram machine because we, right now we go to the clinic, the doctor gives us, I guess, a prescription or you know, an order to go, then we have to get transportation to go and get the, um, uh, get the mammogram, then we have to go back to the VA for the doctor to, um, uh, to read it for us, and we just want to have a mammogram on site. So I you know, started working with my staff, and we were able to get a mammogram machine for the Adelaide Del Guy Medical Clinic. And we did a great ribbon cutting, and it was pink, and it was great, and the lady vets were so excited. In, uh, when we did the ribbon cutting, I was at the podium, and I made a flippant remark. I said, now that we have the, um, uh, the mammogram, we're going to get an MRI. And somebody came over to me when I finished my remarks. They said, you got to think bigger. I said, bigger than an MRI? <laughs> I mean, what? And they said, you need a VA hospital here. You've got several hundred veterans that call Southern Nevada home, and you need to, uh, right now, they have to go to Long Beach if they've got a serious problem. So my staff and I rolled up our sleeves, and that one comment, and the lady vets of my Veterans Advisory Committee were the genesis of that remarkable VA hospital in North Las Vegas, which was 
was part of my congressional district at the time. Uh, that probably is the thing that I'm most proud of during my service, um, and it's continuing to grow. And now I know that the land across the street has been purchased, and we're hoping to create a whole city within a city right near the VA hospital. But um, I agree with you, things move very, very slowly. But, and, and I will say this, this is just an FYI. Um, I know that um, earmarks are frowned on. People are always bitch, piss, spit, and moan about earmarks in the federal budget. But I will tell you this, the VA hospital in North Las Vegas was the largest earmark in the 2006 federal budget. And that's how we ended up with the VA hospital because we were able to earmark the money for a tremendous need that our community and our state had. And it was funded by the feds. And now it, it's servicing thousands and thousands of veterans that call Southern Nevada home. Have I exhausted you? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll try to my voice. And could you tell us your name? So my name is Ephraim, uh, physical therapist and founder and CEO uh, of a company called Lutano. I think uh, I teach at the same school that you at, Toro. Uh, so the problems you talk about healthcare um, are really serious, right? The ability to find a position, book an appointment, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'll cut this short. Uh, as a small business owner, mm -hmm. I'm so, also a software engineer, we created a, a product that takes care of most of that. I think those of you who are in, the, in, uh, in healthcare understand that part of the problem is efficiency, right? We can get the patients in the clinic, but it takes us three times as much time to document and satisfy the insurance company oh, yes. that it does to actually take care of the patient. We are taking an average of five minutes to talk to the patient and 16 mm -hmm. minutes to document. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense uh, in the long run. So all we do is we treat the symptoms, we kick them out, and then they come back over and over again. So I know most people think that it's a numbers problem. If we get more doctors in the field, that's gonna help. Yeah. Um, the other way to look at it is if the doctors spend more time with their patients, maybe the patients wouldn't be coming as many times mm -hmm. as they typically do. But anyways, now to my problem. As a small business company, as a small business in the tech field, um, Las Vegas is notorious for a number of things that we have noticed. Uh, from the mayor's office, uh, monies are allocated for small businesses like us. Mm -hmm. And uh, those of us who are not connected tend to be at the bottom of the, of, of, and sometimes we're not even looking for money, we're just looking for connections. Mm -hmm. Having partnerships with organizations like your casinos so that people who are coming into the city have access to the services they need using technology. I can get a pizza faster then I can get to a doctor. It doesn't make any sense. No, the, pe the pizza might kill me, but the doctor <laughs> might save my life. Uh, it's, it just doesn't. So there's technology that has been created not only by my company, but other companies here in our own backyard. And I think we, we tend to overlook anything that's created here. And we go out to the Bay Area and we try to find solutions to our problems here when there are people here in town. So to just finish this off, what would you do to help us out um, and they're, they're plenty of us, really smart tech people who have created solutions to problems that we all have, mm -hmm. but we seem to not have access to whatever structure political that has been created mm -hmm. around where you can't break through unless you know somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to be a pervasive problem. Um, Ephraim, let me say this. You're not the first person to tell me that. And there's small business people that feel that they are excluded from um, having, an opp having opportunities that others do. I would do everything I can in my power as mayor to ensure that everybody gets a fair shake, everybody has an opportunity to share in the prosperity, and everyone has an opportunity to network and meet other people in the field and in other fields that might benefit them. And you're absolutely right. We have a wealth of talent here in Southern Nevada. We ought to utilize that first. And if by some chance we can't, um, uh, can't, uh, 
utilize um, those people that live here and have certain talents, then, then you go out of state. But until then, you utilize the talent that you have here. I'll do everything I can in order to make sure that that occurs. Now, let me say this, um, and perhaps I'll conclude on this. Um, so I was at an event recently at a barbecue restaurant and I was doing a Q&A and one of the people stood up and asked me what I was going to do to lower the temperature in Las Vegas during the summer months. Now I, I, I probably very little. <laughs> so I think it's very important to fully appreciate the limits of what a mayor can do. You know, I, I, I can do everything, but if I could lower the temperature in Las Vegas, I'd be running for God and not for mayor. Um, so there are certain things that I simply and no one else will be able to solve. But whatever I can, whatever is within my uh, job description and, and uh, utilizing my bully pulpit, which I think a mayor has opportunities to speak out, not on every single subject in the world, because I think that kind of dilutes your strength and your power. But when I say something, it's going to be things that I know about, I care about, and think will make this a better community to live in. We're now, my parents of course have passed, but we're now four generations in Las Vegas. My, my parents, um, my generation, my children's generation, and now there's little Berkeley grandbabies running around. This is our home and we're not going anywhere. So I have a vested interest in making sure that this incredible community that ended on Decatur and Eastern, those were the parameters when we first moved here, there was nothing, nothing in this community um, when we first got here. And the extraordinary growth and development and entrepreneurial spirit that we see in this community every day, I think is nothing short of extraordinary. We can harness this, we can use it, and I will say one other thing, which I said that was the last thing. Um, as I mentioned to you, my father was a waiter when I was growing up. Um, and he went down to the Culinary Union, they sent him to the Old Sands Hotel. Um, he started as a waiter in the old garden room and then moved into the Copa room, and he eventually worked his way up to maitre d'. But on a waiter's salary, he put a roof over our head, food on the table, clothes on our back, and two daughters through college and law school. Not bad on a waiter's salary. It is my commitment to the people coming up behind me that they have the same opportunities that my family had when we first got here. My father never, uh, never coveted what the bosses had, ne just wanted to be able to take care of his family and make sure that his two daughters had uh, an opportunity to uh, to succeed in this country in this community and we have done that i think i owe it to everybody else in this community to make sure that they have the same opportunities that we had we never had a whole lot of money but we had enough and the result of that is that my parents neither one graduated high school by the way uh, my parents were able to produce two pretty good daughters in this community, and everybody should have the chance to produce at least two good daughters <laughs> and, and sons and others. But that's, uh, we have it within our, we can do this. We can do this together. I am so optimistic about the future. And I, again, this is not a political event, but I, I, I just would appreciate any support that any of you would give. And I thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> um, a couple of last announcements. Very interesting. Oh. So uh, if you're not involved with the HEALS task oh, forces, yes. we're really gaining a lot of steam as far as the task forces go. One of them being within the what started as cybersecurity, then morphed into a health technology, and then I said, well, let's plug into the larger 
um, tech community groups only to find out that it didn't exist. So we're actually working oh. together on putting a tech council for Southern Nevada. And I mean, not just for cybersecurity, we see what's happening in the casinos, but also for startups. Um, there's a project we are working on with the hospital association to create VR programs so people in rural areas and underserved areas would be able to experience what it's like to work in an ER, what are all the different job positions, how I can get to those jobs. Um, and as we were discovering, I started looking for companies, as Ephraim said, I started Googling online. Um, next thing you know, I'm looking at some software that's being developed in the Netherlands for training nurses to see how we can plug it in, only to find out that there's two kids uh, that live here in Las Vegas that have been working with Dr. Sinclair at the Harvard School of Medicine, have been working with TCL on VR glasses, and they said, yeah, no, nobody ever contacts us. And I realized how we can actually come up with solutions here within our city. It's exciting to see the support um, of what's happening with tech downtown and the support that is, is going around that. So I'm excited to see what the future looks like. If you'd like to get involved, we, uh, we are forming that, coming up with the vision, strategies, and plans, and then working with our local governments to see what we can do in putting that together. The second thing is with the legislative task force. Um, Shelly mentioned something very interesting, which is you know when someone from healthcare gets involved in politics, that instead of looking to pick them apart or think of when we are competitors or they worked at that company, really have uh, the general support um, for our peers that are looking to step into the processes that would help um, us pass legislation and us push for changes. I was very happy at our last legislative, legislative task force to have multiple lobbyists that came down from, uh, from Carson City and, and, and let us know that with the help of Las Vegas Heels and Vegas Healthcare, working with your Nevada doctors, we actually led one of the largest grassroots effort um, opposing AB 404. They had gotten more pieces of, of handwritten letters and, uh, and constituents that had reached out on AB 404 um, than any other piece of legislation that they mm -hmm. saw. And that wasn't just my effort, but that was a community effort, us coming together. Um, it's the importance of, right, the support of Vegas Healthcare and, and the 17,000 healthcare professionals slash voters um, that are in those groups, but coming together to be able to unify our voice and really push for these changes. And lastly, we have one very, very important announcement. We want to say thank you to Shelly for coming out and we can have one round of applause. Oh, for thank our you. Program. And Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to Kelly and Brown Brown that facilitated all of everything. Tomorrow is a very important event that Kelly helped to facilitate. Larry's going to share a couple of words. How many of you are familiar with the Nevada Healthcare Forum? I saw a couple people. I'm going to have Larry share the vision of the Nevada Healthcare Forum. Again, I am a huge proponent of community coming together and finding solutions. And, and before I was around or while I was still a marketer on the field hitting, uh, Larry put a lot of work into the Nevada Healthcare Forum and bringing together northern and, northern and southern Nevada. So Larry, can you share a couple of words? This is going on tomorrow. You can use a microphone or you can project. Uh, that's right. It's actually the state of Nevada's forum is not north or south. It's our state. So, Speaking of community and unity. <laughs> yes. But tomorrow is our 16th annual. Uh, Governor uh, Navarro will be kicking it off for a morning. We have, right now, passing uh, last night about 1097 people signed up. So it's not too late. It's like, mm. Oh, right. The, uh, yeah, I never know exactly how to pronounce uh, his last name. Donate, Donate. But he's, he's going to be one of the panelists, and of course, Governor Lombardo, and, and thanks to Kelly for really initiating mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I'd like to second that message. I, the first time I went, we're all very busy. We all have things to do. It's 2023. It really is worth taking the time. Um, and for the connections, the panels were great last year. I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this forum this year. So if you want to come out and support, make sure and ask Larry. He can give you the web link. You can sign up. There is still room. And then we can get to those 300, maybe 325 if we give it a good push. Just get in the door. You walk in and give your old American Express card. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's still starts at 8 a.m. tomorrow, but we do online. 
on-site registration as well. Excellent. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be respectful of your time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have a fantastic day. Okay. Great. Okay. Oh.